screen. So Grinda, just just bear with us while we get a few more people jumping onto this. Um, hopefully, which will be an interesting insight into um, you know your specialist subject of Sikh history and in soldiers and um, battle, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so we're just waiting for a few people to join us. So once I see Grinda, well, he has actually joined us. So Grinda, just. Just got some technical support in the back today. I thought I'd um switch some locations today with a bit more better lighting that I normally have. Okay, Grinda. So if I can request you, please, to um hit on the button to request to join this particular live feed. Um, while Grinda's doing that, GI and Usabnu Sasikalji, um. Here we are with myself, Vilaj, on the Punjab 2000 platform. Um, we're going to be talking to Grinda Singh Man, the Sikh scholar, the Sikh historian, about his new publication, The Rise of the Sikh Soldier, the Sikh Warrior Throughout the Circa Period, ages C, circa 1700 to 1900. So we're just waiting for him to join us. So if I can get technical support to get him to join us. And hopefully I'll be able to see him. Yeah, the request has come through. Try that again. Oh, wait, we've got it. Hi, Grinda, you okay? Yeah, sound very good. Thank you, Sashikal. Sashikal, do you, can you hear me? Okay? See me okay? Yeah, everything sounds good. How about my side? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Clear as can be. Um, you know, as you know, with technology, phones tend to be better than normal computers and, you know, the camera accessories that come with it. So, we're good. How are you first on this wonderful sunny day and week we've had so far? Tell me. Absolutely fantastic. Um, things are very good at the moment. Uh, the weather's great. Uh, the book's doing well. We've had a lot of interest since we released it a couple of weeks ago. And <laughs> basically looking forward to this evening and just uh, discussing the book and possibly take a couple of questions from the audience as well. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to say um, this platform is for not just for me to talk to you, Grinda. I'm sure you appreciate it, but this is also for, like I said, the audience to get involved. Um, you know, to ask the questions that they may have or any areas that they may want to question in terms of what they believe or assume or have myths about what they think has or hasn't happened in the past in terms of you know Sikhs and their you know uh, participation in war and you know warfare and armies and so forth. Um, so for those that don't know, Grinda Singh Man, he's been you know. Um, a Sikh historian for you know, at least 25 plus years. Um, you know, he's got the title Sikh, Sikh, God, sorry, Sikh scholar for, you know, with all intentions because of what he's achieved in terms of qualifications, his experience, his education. Um, and it's not just something that comes easily to someone that, um, you know, talks about these, these particular um, areas of um, you know knowledge in terms of what's happened in the past, but you know you've you know you've produced publications on this. They've been out in the university you know press and circulation. Um, you know, just to give you a couple of examples. You obviously had um, you know a while ago. I'm going back in history now. You had you know three books: Sikh history, one of Guru Gobind Singh's um, you know um, scriptures, I believe it was. Um, you know the Grant of Guru Gobind Singh, and the one we spoke about on our last interview, which was about Sikh discovery, warfare, and friendship in 2020. So you know you've been doing this for a number of years, and it's not just purely you know, um, research that's based, you know, from online, you are physically going to locations, searching through artifacts, manuscripts, paperwork, speaking to people that are connected. You know, it's not just, you know, you're not a Google, you're not a Google historian, you are a historian, literally back to basics. Um, and, I want, you know, for those that, you know, um, are really, really interested, I want you to kind of give me a bit more context and substance to what I've just said there, you know, because uh, I want to know, and I've asked you this before, and sometimes I think you don't always give the answer that you want to because, you know, you're just being diplomatic. But, you know, Grinda, Sikh history, what, what, what is your motivation? Now, the easy answer is, oh, it's part of my culture, my religion. But you, to me, you're, you're almost like the person that is so almost like obsessed with this particular area of history, you just constantly talk about it. Even when we talk off camera and, you know, on a kind of casual basis, you're constantly talking about what's going on and, you know, how you can make it better and how you can spread the knowledge. So, you know, tell me about your motivation and, you know, what's made you get into this field of work? 
Yeah, firstly, to all the listeners, viewers, everybody from around the world who's logged in, I uh, just want to say Sasikal and thanks everybody for joining. Yeah, thanks for the introduction, Valraj, and, and the rest of the uh, Punjab 2000 team as well. Um, for me, it's always been the essence of the Sikhs are a smaller religion in comparison with the world major faiths if that makes sense. And to some extent, the larger faith you are, the more you have in terms of resources, more in terms of where the reach is in terms of your dharam, in terms of your faith, if that makes sense. So as we're considered one of the smaller religions in relation to the Christianities, the Islam, Buddhism, etc., you we have to therefore make sure that we're still seen if that makes sense as also. And because we're smaller, we have to do more. We have to probably do five times more to make sure that our word gets out there as well. Mm -hmm. So we have a faith which has produced um, spiritualness through the, through the scriptures. We've created warriors through the military side of things. We've also created um, certain concepts and ideas which essentially the rest of the, we should be sharing with the rest of the world. So for me, it's never been about researching history for the Sikhs per, per se. It's always been about research, then who else I can tell? So that I could tell you the story, like I said, we talk off camera quite a lot. I could talk to my neighbor quite comfortably. I could talk to someone down the road. I can talk to someone across the world. And I think we have to package, and the way we look at Sikhi is, has to be that way where we're comfortable with talking to people quite easily. Uh, we do have some deficiencies where people can't sometimes connect the dots. Their uh, information is only palatable or they only receive it from one area. It may be the good one, it may be from social media. Mm -hmm. But Correct. from a historical point of view, that does take time and it takes laborious hours. And you just mentioned, I'm not a Google scholar, I'm a field scholar. And there's a big difference here. If you're not prepared, to go a thousand miles or 10,000 miles or 50,000 miles to actually discover and look at the way Sikh history was actually shaped, then you're going to have to watch some Disney movie instead. That's my take on stuff. <laughs> and it's as simple as that. Yeah, there's, no time, that. there's no time for part-time scholars in this game. There's no time for Google scholars in this game. But that's not to put people off either. Um, the idea is also to educate. It's also to lift people up and say, OK, well, here are the resources that you may want to tap into and to further your knowledge. But if you're a youngster and you want to climb some kind of ladder in Sikh history, then where can you go to uh, to, you know, to attain that knowledge? So therefore, it's a bit of more of an open playing field as well. Grinda, you know, many times in the past, you know, you know, through various platforms, including with myself, we spoke about, you know, these um, Sikhs that um, were shown through their armies, um, you know, and the warfare and certain individuals that, you know, were the leaders in that particular field. How important and what was the connection in terms of Sikh history and the Gurus and the battlefield? See, the whole idea about Sikhi is about Sant Sabai, which is Saint Soldier. OK, so Sant Spai is talking about Saint Soldier. So we cannot have the soldiery side without the saintly side. And the saintly side is eff effectively all about, you know, the belief in our scriptures. But then when it comes to righteousness, and we have these concepts via Guru Gobind Singh as well, Dharam Yod, so only battles for righteousness. These are not battles for the sake of territory during the Guru period. This is battles for survival. It's for ensuring that, um, you know, whilst the persecution is taking place by the Mughals, for instance, how do you actually kind of fight back? So the early phase during the, the Guru period, mainly from the fifth Guru, Guru Arjun Dev, uh, we start seeing the formation of an army. That's not to say from the time of Guru Nanak, he was not against oppression, hypocrisy, and other things which uh, we would actually find, you know, not palatable if you're, if you're a normal person. So the idea was that by the time we get to the sixth Guru, Guru Hargobind Sahib, we actually have this concept of Mirik Bidi, which is, again, similar to Sansabai in the idea that, um, you know, the saintly side and the worldly side is balanced with a bit more of a kind of martial um, side as well. And as a result of that, on his investiture as Guru, Guru Hargobind Sahib um, dons the two Tulvara, 
you know. So mm -hmm. yeah. that be, the, it's not the beginning technically of the mil military kind of phase because even during Guru Arjan Dev, he had already started recruiting soldiers. This is where people go wrong. They think it all started during the time of Guru Hargobind Sahib. It didn't it actually started during Guru um, uh, Guru Arjan Dev's time, but you know, th there's always been this idea that the Sikhs are against oppression. So when it leads to the first battles uh, by Guru Har Gobind Sahib, it then leads to various other trustees undertaken by the Mughal Empire against Guru um, Degh Bahadur Sahib, where he has a Shahidi. And that, and we get to this idea of the Khalsa under Guru Gobind Singh, who formalizes the concepts of military warfare as well. And I talk quite considerably about this early phase in my introduction to the book as well. Okay, and I found out. I mean, give me some context and understanding. I'm mean, to be fair, I'll be quite selfish because I, was, I wanted to know what that connection was. So that gives you a bit of a rounded answer. So yeah, no, that completely makes sense. So again, I just want to make it very, very clear, guys. This is your platform for um, you guys to ask questions. So please, you know, if you have any questions, you know, obviously I'm here to kind of. Um, facilitate that contact between you guys and Grinder and obviously ask the questions to keep the flow here but please jump in ask any questions you know anything you want to know this is your opportunity it's a golden opportunity let's um, you know let's let's talk about it because we're here to talk about his new book but I'm sure Grinder as always will be welcome to any other questions around these particular topics um, Grinder how does one go into actually um researching Sikh history you know what, what's the kind of I, I don't know can you do you have an ideal path is there a set path are there different ways yeah I mean um I started before well the ascension of the actual um internet essentially so I started you know uh, mid uh, I was going to say 1900s then <laughs> that made me really old then um, so around 1995 onwards is when I started and essentially you know this is like before just about when the internet age is starting so there is never ever going to be a replacement for actual research at libraries at gurdwaras at havilis um, and then the idea that um, of actually kind of researching um also um in different faiths as well because sometimes and different literature of other faiths now let me ex clarify that as well because sometimes um we sometimes are a bit despondent that we don't have um sources for Sikh history and we say well we don't have this information here we don't have that information here so we have to sometimes turn to British sources we have to turn to Persian sources we have to turn to various other sources as well and that involves language skills as well so that gets a bit more complicated in terms of not just finding the information deciphering it and then translating it as well so but there's different shades in terms of archives which people can visit in the uk itself there's various kind of libraries including the british library which is very accessible and you know you can actually access material from there across like i said from india you know there's just so much information that's available i think quite rightly sometimes people just don't know where to start where to start where to start we're going to talk about the book now um so this is your next publication the rise of the Sikh soldier the Sikh warriors through the ages circa 1700 to 900 so tell me about the context of this book. what is this book all about does it lead on naturally from your last publication or is this a completely separate focus um it's not it, it it's similar but dissimilar at the same time if that makes sense because the British and the Sikhs was essentially about um, the you know the kind of relationship between the Sikhs coming up and the East India coming up and looking at whilst that also looked at military warfare as well but it also looked at translators looked at translations of the Sikhs and looked at other facets like Sikh relics and artifacts so how Sikh relics and artifacts came to, to UK, to the UK from the Punjab. So there's a lot more varied content in that. This particularly is all about the Sikh military history from the 18th century, uh, covering the aspects of the Sikh empire and various other areas as well. So this is a bit more broader, but goes into depth in terms of all the different phases of Sikh military history in essence. So but what is the importance of East India? Because we hear it so many times referenced when it comes to Sikh history and battles and war, but some people may not know what the importance and focus it is of that, you know, and how much influence it had. So, so just to put in context, the East India Company came into uh, India um, around about 1600. 
And so what they did was the, the whole idea of the East India Company was to go to go to trade. So they were given kind of treaties to actually be able to trade in India. And then from the 1600 onwards, their power started increasing. When we get to the 1700s, they're actually now actually able to effectively um, barter with the Mughal Empire and also able to raise taxes as well. So they've gone quite a bit from their early inception. But then the East India Company, what they do is they actually have this idea of trade but also they keep an army with them to protect their trade. Right. So some people think the East India Company is just an army. It's not. The East India Company went out to the to India to trade, but they were facilitated by an army. Now this could have been the locals from where they were where they were based. They could have, and then they also had uh, soldiers who came from England as well, which actually looked after their interest. They also um, worked with other groups to actually have the, uh, ind indigenous armies um, in, in India, for instance. So the East India Company, like I said, trading company had a military aspect to it as well. And then what used to happen is if they didn't get their way, they'd use their military arm to get what they wanted. <laughs> That's in a nutshell, essentially. And Grindel, what effect did that have on Punjab and the continent and the subcontinents? Was there any impact you know, in terms of infrastructure? Um, in the 1700s onwards, there was very little contact uh, with the East India Company and the Sikhs in terms of military. There was like little bit of correspondence uh, taking place mid 1700s it was the other way round it was the sikhs who were attacking east india company territory actually in the late in the late 1700s so we're talking about under bagil singh under justice singh ramgarhia they actually reached an area called anupshar which was a east india company stranglehold and a small skirmish took place between the British and Sikhs because normally we think about uh, the battles of the Anglo Sikh wars, but small skirmishes did take place in the 17, late 1700s, very little. Um, but it also put the Sikhs on a plateau as well to actually let groups like the Mughals, the Rohillas, uh, the Rajputs, the Marathas, and the East India Company know that the Sikhs are not just a Punjab based um, Dharam or faith or group. We're kind of a bit more global, at least from the northern Indian point of view. OK, so again, you know, purely for context and, you know, for, in layman's terms, from someone that's for me, someone like me that's always wanting to learn. What, essentially, what is this new book about then? So the idea is to actually kind of go through uh, Sikh military history, but go through the through the idea of certain individuals as well. It's very easy to, uh, to do a chronological history, 1700 to 1750, 1750 yeah, to 1800. But I wanted to go through the, the idea of certain individuals, certain Khalsa warriors. So I've chosen names like uh, Jasa Singh Alawalia, Jarat Singh Sakajakia. I've talked about the females, we'll, we'll talk about that as well, which is Sadakor and Sebkor, and mm -hmm. Fula Singh. Uh, Hari Singh Nalwa, Lena Singh Majithia. And the idea is these pertinent people, I've kind of um, tried to show their history as to how they molded um, you know, the Sikh empire and also the missile period, which is the 18th century, the missile period to an effective way of which the Sikhs used to govern. So let's get this clear as well. This is not just about military history. It's all about governance as well, about the Sikhs having a government if that makes sense, the issuing of coins as well. It's not just, and I use this word kindly, a rag bag bunch of soldiers who are just going out there marauding or trying to protect their faith. There mm. has this scientific nature of the Sikhs in terms of actually having governance. And I think that's a very, very important point, which I'm trying to make as part, part of the book. And this is going to actually bring me on naturally to my next question. So when this connection um happened between the british and you know the um you know the sikhs you know who were you know, part of an operation you know military wise or army wise who was the more dominant power was it a case of the british said look we'll tell you what to do this is how you're going to do it or were Sikhs pretty st um pretty strong and say no we're going to do things our way um, how did that contact communication happen well it's really interesting actually because this is a really really pivotal point in the 18th century um, the, uh, at the late later half of the 18th century, people like Jassa Singh Alawalia, who's the head of the Buddha Dal, um, and other Sikh leaders as well, they actually wrote letters to the British and vice versa. 
So we as Sikhs used to have vakils, as in like our kind of agents, if you want to call it that, in the Delhi Darbar, for instance. So Shah Alam was the emperor. The Sikhs used to have envoys there. All the other different groups used to have envoys as well. And there used to be the passing of letters via Delhi. So we can study those letters between the British and the Sikhs. And we actually find that the British are trying to figure out what the Sikhs are all about. They're trying to figure out, are they a, a threat to them? Are they a threat to Delhi? And this is how the initial um, kind of correspondence starts between the British and the Sikhs, because the British want to know exactly what the Sikhs are about, because when they start dominating Delhi from 1783 onwards, at least, um, you know, it makes them think as to who is this new power. So through correspondence, they start getting this kind of, wouldn't use the word friendship, but they, but the words used in all the letters are friendship. We want to have friendship, but, you know, it's more a kind of cloak as to what that word friendship actually means. Yeah, so you touched upon it briefly, but just to go in a bit more detail. So what, in terms of this actual book, The Rise of Sikh Soldier, what is so different about this book compared to, and from the one I obviously referenced earlier on from 2020, the British and the Sikhs, what's the main difference? I think this uh, this has more. I mean, just from a aesthetic point of view, this has more images. It has uh, more. It has more maps in it as well, which I think um, really um, accentuates the book. There's actual chapters which are uh, go into depth as well. Whilst the first book does talk about the Anglo Sikh wars, this time round, there's all the kind of details which go along with the battles as well. There's elusive maps, for instance, showing Sikh positions as well. Now, this is really really important when you actually look at um the study of the anglo sikh wars what you see is maps but you always see the british positions but you never see the sikh generals i really wanted to actually make sure that every map that was in this book actually had the sikh position because i've seen a lot of um, anglo sikh war maps and it just says sikh or it just says artillery infantry or cavalry but never the names of the leaders so i wanted to purposely make sure that there's detail to these specific maps which were included and where did you source and verify the maps and the information was legitimate in terms of location and positions, you know, of these individuals on the maps or these groups on the maps? Yeah, well, firstly, we had, well, I had um, some information because you kind of got the idea of what artillery is we have. Uh, and then we also have the descriptions. So whilst I'm talking about the descriptions of the battlefield, we know that the British commanders were on the right, in the middle, on the left. We know that the Sikhs were on the right, and the middle, and the left. So I'm a bit perplexed that no maps have been created in depth, which shows us, which show the Sikh position, because when it comes to descriptions, it's always been there. But um, I just wanted to make sure that, you know, that we covered it effectively um, as part of this book. Okay. I'm just going to move on to the next question now. In the book, you touched upon um, the seat missile. Um, quite an interesting area. Um, you're gonna, you have, you kind of mentioned a couple of names. You covered Jared Singh and just as in, you know, Alawalia. Why did you choose those particular Khalsa, you know, chiefs? And there were others in the book, but those particular ones, they were highlighted. You know, expand on that. Tell me a bit more about it. Give me some context to that. Yeah, I think the 18th century is probably one of the most um, important, but most Un, not understood, if that makes sense, misunderstood, should I say, is the word. Mm -hmm, yeah. and the reason for that is because we think we know what happened in the 18th century. We talk about the Shahids who actually laid down their lives, which, you know, is plentiful. We get that through Qatar, we get that through various stories. We've got um, a great text called the Bant Prakash by Rata Singh Bungu, which gives a great history of, you know, the missile period. But when we look at specific individuals, whether they be Baba Deep Singh, whether they be Bagil Singh, whether they be Jassa Singh Alawalia, etc. We don't get the essence of their life livelihoods and their lifestyles. When I mean lifestyle, I don't mean fashion-wise. I mean in terms of what they were trying to actually achieve and the concepts that they introduced. So for me personally, it was a case of um, starting off with Jassa Singh Alawalia because he was given the mantle. When I say mantle, he was given the actual idea of leading the Sikhs. He was given the custodian of being commander in chief by Nawab Kapoor Singh. So if you look at it from a, a chronological point of view, we have Gurugabind Singh, 
uh, Maharaj after his uh, ascension, uh, Jyoti Jyot. We then have um, Banda Singh Bahadur, but then the next leader is Nawab Kapoor Singh. And Nawab Kapoor Singh actually trains Jassa Singh Alawalia to become commander in chief and head of the Buddha Dal as well. So what Jassa Singh Alawalia does is he creates this division of two groups, the Buddha Dal and the Tarna Dal. All it just means is the older generation of Sikhs and the younger generation of Sikhs which are coming up. Buddha obviously sounds old, Dharna means to swim, so you, you, you're up and coming, essentially. So this group um, was all under the um, under the direction of Jassa Singh Alawalia. So for the 40 years that he's commanding the Sikhs, he has to go through the turbulent times of the Shota and Vada Gulugara. That essentially means the smaller Holocaust and the larger Holocaust. Okay, and essentially, yeah. yeah, and, and essentially the, the Wadda Gulagara, which takes place in 1762, almost wipes at least a third or more of the Sikh population out in a space of a few days. And it's through the Kadbani of people like Justice Singh Alawalia who made sure that there was never a complete wipeout of the Sikhs, that we have to kind of pay homage to people like Justice Singh Alawalia. So that was the reason for actually having um, the discussion on Justice Singh Alawalia. If we now turn to Jarat Singh Sakachakia, he was the grandfather of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. So we talk quite a lot about Maharaja Ranjit Singh, but then we forget where he came from. So I want to talk about Jarrod Singh, who actually, you know, he was fighting for space with other groups as well, like the Bungies, like the Bungie Missile, for instance. He was younger than the rest of some of the missile leaders. But as he came along, he learned a lot from them. And in the end, he managed to carve out areas like Gujaranwala, which is in modern day Pakistan and other territories around that area as well. And I think the key thing was about uh, Jarat Singh was he was able to take some of the territories from the Bungies, the Bungie missile, and then add it to his domains. And then his son, who is Maha Singh, he was able to kind of also establish those territories leading up to the young Maharaja Ranjit Singh having, I wouldn't say he had everything already on a plate because that because that'd be wrong, that'd be very disingenuous, but they, there was a good platform for the time yeah. of Maharaja yeah, Ranjit Singh that's ready. That's and then he was also helped by uh, Sadakor, which we can probably touch on later on as well. But it was the that's whole idea of before you get to Ranjit Singh, what happened first? So again, I'm just going to go up to the people that are watching. Guys, again, this is not my interview. This is your interview. So, you know, I can talk forever for England um, and beyond. But please, by all means, if you want, if you've got any questions for Grinda, now's your opportunity. Anything you want to know about the book, anything else, Sikh history, battle related, arm related, Sikh history, soldiers, anything you want to know, ask by all means, jump in. I'll certainly, you know, try my best to answer those questions. You were talking earlier on. This is just purely, again, for my, you know, from my thinking. As some of you may or may not be aware here, um, you know, Grinder Singh Man is actually the digital curator of the Sikh Museum Initiative. I said it was was it Sikh Museum Initiative, right? Anglo Sikh Virtual Museum. Museum. Okay, Anglo Sikh uh, Virtual Museum. And thinking about what you just said, that's referred to in the book. Would it not be a fantastic opportunity with your team to maybe? have virtual maps of the soldiers in battle at various locations. Just a fleeting thought. Um, no, absolutely. I mean, all these ideas that we talk about, I mean, obviously, just to let the uh, viewers know that uh, with our anglo Sikh Virtual Museum is a digital 3D just depository of Sikh relics, essentially. So yeah. we've been able to actually kind of um, digitize objects from private and public collections, make them available, and you can view them in a 3D format. It, quite rightly, uh, the team have talked for many years in terms of what could be done next, um, you know, in terms of moving away from objects. And there's a discussion on about landscapes. There's also a discussion right. in terms of forts exactly. and, and gilas and things like that as well. It is something we are We've always talked about it depends on the funding you see and how, how much funding we get before we can actually embark on something like this. It's, you know, our bill has been passionate about uh, our preservation of Sikh history and heritage. And, uh, you know, we have to get support from people as well. The more support we get, then we can do more outputs as well. Because as you're aware, I'm an output person. So, you know, yeah. I'll do a lecture, I'll do an exhibition, you know, I'll do a book, you know what I mean? So I'll, the whole idea is actually having outputs from the, the technology you have, but also the resources you have as well. But yeah, it's definitely something um, that might be possible in the future. 
Yeah, yeah. And I think as technology develops, I'm hoping, you know, with the team you've got, you've got Qatar and then you've got the rest of the guys, you know, that you've got a lot of, um, you know, you know, people there with a lot of back in terms of what they know. And I think technology is, you know, at a point where you can literally do anything. But obviously everything is subject to resources and time and investment, isn't it? No, absolutely. And, you know, uh, not like I said, it's not that this has not been discussed already. You know, we've got, yeah. we have about a thousand ideas. So, you know, it's about yeah. what's practical, what can be done, what can be put into fruition, what is, you know, with our resources that we have, what can actually be achieved, if that makes sense. So, um, so that's, that's what it comes down to. So, you know, it's something maybe for, for the future, really. Feature. Um, got a question coming in from um, Harry Tandy. Harry, thanks for your um, question. Hopefully, you can answer this one, Grinda. It's an interesting question, actually. Um, what has happened to the seat documents taken during Operation Blue Star from the seat library? Do you have any input or insight onto that? Into okay. that? So, so it's not really my area in terms of modern Sikh history, even though you know it's a very, very important period. If that makes sense, the, the way it works and what has been detailed is as follows: the Seat reference library was, um, you know, parts of it were burnt. The, the Indian army took away grants and a lot of literature away. Okay. But then they gave it back. See, this is what people don't understand. So for many years, there was this big drama about uh, the, the Sikh manuscripts are never given back, etc. There is actual documentation. It's, it's gone to the courts now where the SGPC has been taken to court for not actually declaring that the, the grants and various documentation that was taken by the Indian Army was then returned back to the Sikh Reference Library. So, you know, people need to Google it if they don't know already what's happened, because for many, many years there was this narrative that the British Army had everything, but they returned it back many years ago. And so therefore, it's in the courts now because public individuals who know who have been in the Sikh reference library in the in the Punjab at Harman, you know in the Harman Sahib, which is where the Sikh reference library is kept, and they've seen the documentation to say it's been returned. So you know there's always been these myths around what's been going on around that um, uh, time period. Interesting person called Anrag Singh, who was the director of the library um, recently of so many years ago. He's the one who kind of figured out that there's some kind of um, something underhand going on in yeah. terms of the return of, but that's, you know, that's not exactly my area of history, but that's what I know from the information I've seen. Um, just for my information, maybe also our viewers out there, have you ever had the opportunity to look at the library at Harmandar Saab and look at the manuscripts and documentation and, you know, for your own research purposes? Yeah, briefly, um, but the problem has been is that the majority of the items um, which yeah. were there are no longer there, no and, there. The ones, and the ones which are supposed to have been returned aren't there either so there's a lot lot going on like I said but um, but there's various kind of libraries all across the Punjab which has you know great information available there's archives available that even some of the museums have things but they they're a bit harder to have access to I mean obviously here in the UK, um, the amount of different grants that we have at the British Library and various other university libraries across the UK is immense as well. So, you know, there's no no reason why people in the UK should not be visiting those specific libraries to actually widen and further their knowledge as well. OK, so coming back to the book and thank you very much for your question, Harry. If anybody else has any questions, by all means, do jump in and Grinda will certainly try his best to um, yeah, answer as you know, best as he can. Um, so. We we're talking about female empowerment earlier on, um, and the book does obviously cover and touch upon, um, or should I say, features Saib Gaur and um, Sadda Gaur. How important is is it to ensure that the female voices are heard during this period? I think uh, what's actually happened is um, I think Sikh historians have been very disingenuous in terms of not giving the kind of um, respect that Sikh women should have in the calm. Um, we talk about the Guru period, but when we talk about the Missile period, which is a very, very pivotal point, and also the um, Sikh Empire period as well, we actually find that uh, 
the Sikh women were actually very, very powerful. And they've actually been absolutely you know, relegated, negated, and just faceless as well. So we don't even know what they look like because the portraiture is never brought to the masses, if that makes sense. So what I wanted to do was to at least devote a couple of chapters to two pivotal women. One was, uh, one is, should I say, Sadakor, who was the um, mother-in-law of Maharaja Ranjit Singh. And her importance is she's part of the Kanaya missile, but she was the individual who allowed Maharaja Ranjit Singh to climb that ladder to become the Maharaja, if that makes sense. So without his help, without her help, sorry, I don't think um, Maharaja Ranjit Singh could have got to that position. So just to put it in context, um, Sada Kaur's daughter, Matab Kaur, was married to Ranjit Singh. OK, and then as a result of that, that's why Sadako wanted to actually create an alliance to actually put him as Maharaja, therefore to increase her kind of power as well. The problem was that Maharaja Ranjit Singh was had many wives and that wasn't to the liking of Sadako. So therefore, tensions uh, grew between them. So but that doesn't diminish at all. If anything, it is the it's the contrary to actually say that the role that Sadako um, played during the early stages of Rajit Singh's empire was actually and should be recognized for what it is. So that's why the homage is paid to Sadako. But then talking about someone a bit more, probably not as well known as Seb Kaur. So we talk about the state of Patiala. Now Patiala has sometimes with a lot of people has a lot of negative connotations in terms of how they've supported say, uh, the Durrani Empire, so when Ahmed Shah Dali came, Patiala kind of kept themselves neutral when it came to the missiles, they wanted to like be on their own, but also in terms of their power play, they did what they did in terms of getting what they can from the Khalsa as well. But what you find is that the women were very, very strong. So we talk about individuals like Rajinder Kaur, we talk about individuals like Seb Gord because Seb Gord was actually also married to a Kanaya chief as well. But she was recalled by her brother, Seb Singh, to become the prime minister of Patiala because Patiala was facing a lot of invasions or possibilities of invasions. So Seb Gord becomes the, um, the prime minister of Patiala. Her first incursion in battle is with the Marathas. So the Marathas have come all the way from the areas around Delhi, crossed to, crossed the Jamuna, and they've approached uh, Patiala. But they didn't come to have battle with Patiala, they came to fight Jeend. So what Sadakor is now saying is that, uh, look, if it's Jeend first, then it's going to be Patiala next. So why don't we take the offensive and try and protect Jeend? Because if Jeend goes down, then we go down next. But why don't we help Jeend, as in the state of Jeend? So her brother, Sab Singh was not so keen, but she took her forces down. She was helped by other male missile leaders as well, which kind of shows the respect she was given by the male brethren in terms of warriors. So therefore, the, the Marathas were defeated at that particular point. We then move on to other battles she uh, participated in, and this includes the battles with someone called George Thomas. So an Irishman, a mercenary, so not a part of the East India Company, but someone who just created his own little town, called it George Gad, and then thought, well, you know what, I'm going to take out all the Sikhs. And he had the advantage because he had artillery, so he had guns with him. The Sikhs were a bit more inferior in terms of gun warfare at that particular time. So he attacks Patiala, um, again, Sabkul gets the gets the help of people like Bagheel Singh, for instance, and others, and helps to actually protect and ward off the the, the issues that could have faced Patiala. In the end, uh, Sikhs are victorious, and Sabkul is actually praised. But her brother Sab Singh is very very jealous of the way she, she's actually conducted herself, and he actually imprisons her. For doing a good deed, he imprisons her. And who, comes, and who comes to the rescue? 
George Thomas, George Thomas. <laughs> yeah. the person that they were battling with. And eventually a peace treaty takes place. And then, but still at the end of the day, um, she actually went into relatively obscurity because of the male dominance within the Patiala court. But just, I wanted to highlight her role just to show that, you know, Sikhs were, the Sikh women were warriors as well, but also they had diplomatic skills as well. So I think it's really, really important. On one hand, we have, uh, you know, the military skills, but also the diplomatic skills as well. So which need to be actually kind of discussed more, I think, when we use the word military. Military. Um, Grinda, how is a Sikh scholar, historian like yourself and other historians out there able to, you know, get such detailed accounts of what actually happened and how it happened and how, you know, um, the particular fighters or, you know, individuals that are involved in the wars felt and, you know, how they celebrated, etc. You know, because it, there's such a storyline there. But you know, I, I, I mean, one can only assume there must have been some diarized notes. There must have been written accounts through newspapers. You know, logic would prevail. But maybe there's other sources as well. I, I don't know. You know, you know, enlighten me. Well, interestingly, uh, we do have Sikh sources about uh, Seb Kaur, but in but but the British sources are abundance at that time. So we're talking about the 1790 period on. Uh, now we're talking about the 1790s area and essentially um during that time we have accounts by george thomas himself so he wrote a book say narrating his history and you know those battles that he had we have other british individuals at that time um narrating what happened as well and even later when we get to the 1800 periods we actually get it's it's, it's, it's interesting to note that the british are saying that the Patiala women were stronger than the men, which, okay. you know, which is really, really fascinating. And I've got all these accounts in the book as well. So it was just an idea that even at that time or later, uh, Seb Gore, for instance, was praised by the British, but yet it's taken, you know, hundreds and hundreds of years, well, not hundreds, but decades and decades later mm. for us to actually recognise the accomplishments of someone like Seb Gore. What about the accounts, if there was any, of the press at the time, you know, be it British or Indian, whichever it might be, you know, it may, it may have been political, it may have been biased, you know, or was there anything like that you looked at to gain those, you know, references? Okay, so um, there is accounts, like I mentioned earlier on about the Delhi Durbar, so Dubai, the yes, court, I remember that. Yeah, the court was in Delhi, and interestingly, news reports used to go out to people, so, uh, or Information used to go out, say, to the East India Company in Persian. They used to translate into English. Other And the, the Marathas used to have information. That used to get translated into different languages. But remember, the Sikhs were always communicating in Persian. So Persian, the, yes. all, all, all the actual text is actually in Persian. But we do have translations of it as well. And the point here is that even British newspapers from at least the 1750 onwards were reporting on the Sikhs. And we have copies of these as well. There's only, we don't talk about snippets in a whole newspaper, but they do exist. And then when yeah. we get to the actual 1800 period and the Anglo-Sikh wars, the inches of columns have got bigger. And it, we're they talking about page, and the page sizes now when we get to the Anglo-Sikh war, war, wars period. And just for the, for the, for the viewers, 1846 to 1849, Sikhs are everywhere in like the newspapers like the Illustrated London News, for instance. Yeah, yeah. And it's interesting you say that, because I vividly remember you said it so many times to me, both in our interview, in interview before, and obviously when we've you know, met up and spoke, that having these accounts is like, um, a jigsaw you have to get one piece from here you have to get another piece from there until you get the best fit or full picture that you can as a full jigsaw because without that you're never going to get the full representation of what actually happened and that could take weeks it could take months but realistically it's years so it's so so true that you have to get you know every little piece to try and get the best reflection and representation of what actually happened um and you know like I say it, it can be time consuming can't it it absolutely is. And, and you use the word years at the end. Um, and essentially, certain parts of the historical uh, narration I've worked on, some, some bits have taken years. And, you know, sometimes you just haven't got the information or certain information just doesn't make sense. It's about shifting through this information. And like I've mentioned before as well, it is definitely a jigsaw puzzle in terms of fitting the pieces, uh, whether it be language, whether it be accounts, whether it be like going to a Havili, 
whether going to Forbes, and then piecing all that together. Because sometimes you can't just piece it together with one bit of information. We cannot rely on one bit of information and say that's the end or final, because that could be wrong. So, you know, where I yeah. can, where I can, I try to supplement it with at least other bits of information which kind of lead to that same conclusion. So if yeah. you look through the book, it's heavily footnoted all the way through. Yeah, yeah. And I think this is where the um, importance of factual references is important and more so that it's verified not just a screenshot off in the internet or google link you know yeah you know, so some things as verified as they can be and i'm sure you pretty much scrutinize even what people will say is verified or you know agencies otherwise i say verified because i know you you know you, <laughs> you that's just the way you are you won't just because someone says he tells you that's what is grinda you won't, just accept it you will ask about 20 questions around that before you consider it and then you'll do your own research afterwards um I'm just conscious of time, but I think we've got a good flow going on. And while we're talking about female empowerment, we've had a question come through. Um, Escatura Saab, thank you very much. Um, it's a great question, actually. And, you know, like I said, it links in nicely to what we're talking about at the moment. On the topic of female seat leaders, Grinda, how would you describe the rule of Marta Saab, Devi, and Dili? And what evidence is there of this? So, yeah, yes, it looked to me like a challenging question, but I'm sure you've got an answer of some sort. Uh, evidence uh, sorry evidence of what sorry just can you repeat the question again yeah so it says on the topic of female seat leaders how mm. would you describe the rule of Marta side Devi and Dili and what evidence is there of this so what's the evidence that backs yeah. that she had that in her power so Marta Saib Devi um, and the and other leaders at that time we have uh, what we call um hukum name okay so hukum name are uh, directives which were issued for the Sikhs, because they were based in Delhi, they could, were able to send letters out to the Sangats to say to support the Sikh cause in the Punjab. So we have that as direct evidence. Um, historical sources in the 18th century, uh, when we talk about books, and I, I talked about documents in Persian, but we also have books in Punjabi as well, which were written in the 18th century. So we have people, people like, the, you know, books like the and Salvi Nama written by Keshav Singh Jibbar. We have uh, the God Bilas literature, which talks about history. So we have all these anecdotes regarding Mata Seb Devi um, in Delhi. And also um, we have those instructions. So this is not conjecture. This is actual fact. I can't go into all the different uh, kind of documents per se right now, but yes, they all exist. And where the Hukam Nami um the only source or were there other examples or documents that were there to verify the you know her rule you know what other kind of examples were there that were used well that was the only type of documents we actually have for wow. per se if that makes sense so whether it be buy money sing um whether it be anyone else during that time it was hokum namas especially from the guru period onwards which actually showed or gave evidence of of leadership if if we can say that Okay, so guys, we're here live with Grinder Singh Man, Sikh, Sikh scholar, Sikh historian. So by all means, do jump in with your questions. We're talking about his new publication, The Rise of the Sikh Soldiers. So it'd be great to get your input as well. This is not my interview. This is our interview. So please jump in. You know, you know we're all Mr. Dost here. So do not be shy. Whatever you want to ask. It might not even be around the book. It might be about any other issues that are related, which Grinder might be able to answer around Sikh history, Sikh soldiers, military, warfare, armies, etc. So yeah, by all means, jump in. You know, this is your platform, not mine. Quite dire, I mean, and he's, you know, sorry like that, but it's all yours to make the most of. Right. So the rise of the Sikh soldier, the publication's out. Now, it's obviously... A military book um and you can tell that you can tell by that from looking at the cover fantastic image by the way um what was the main changes that maharaj ranjit singh um took to actually improve and change his military and his approach yeah i think what we have to establish is during the missile period in the 18th century uh, darwin Sadi, we call it um the idea was that the sikhs were Goraswar, which means they were cavalry okay so as long as you had a, a horse you had a musket, you had a tavar, you could become, you could join the museum. Yeah, you, were like you were good to go. Yeah, you were good to go, basically. And um, unfortunately, whilst there was artillery within the seat missiles, but not to a highly developed level, if that makes sense. They were able to capture some guns like the, the we call it the Bungi and the Thorpe, which they captured from the, you know, from the Afghans, even though it's a Mughal gun. And then, but there's very limited in terms of use of artillery. 
So when we get to the Maharaja Ranjit Singh period, so 1800 onwards, Ranjit Singh actually creates uh, ordnance factories. He actually gets the manufacture of guns, so therefore to actually ensure that the Sikh military is up, is up to purpose, if that makes sense. And I know we'll probably talk about the Europeans in a second, mm -hmm. but um, the idea was to actually have great individuals within his um empire and these individuals included people like Lena Singh Majithia. He was a technologist, he was a you know astronomer, you can call him that. He was actually an inventor and basically he was able to create these foundries and also create these cannons which were so effective when we get to the Anglo Sikh wars um, they were more superior to the British. So the idea was to actually ensure that the artillery was on point to actually have an Infantry and infantry is um, when we come to battles, they either protect forts, for instance, or that they're, they're the front line when it comes to a battle. And the Sikhs never had much infantry and they never had much artillery. So it was the idea of making a complete military system, which Maharaja Ranjit Singh actually uh, made. Wow. So he actually brought a lot of experience and what he had there and applied it to, you know, the Sikhs to actually use in battle. And, you know, was that was that quite an easy transition or was there any resistance to that? Yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned that because uh, the infantry, as you if you if you look at, um, I don't know, we've just seen the Jubilee here now in the UK and we see that, the, you know, the, the guards marching, for instance, it to some extent, it looks like a ballet. OK, now at the time in the Punjab, Sikhs used to call it the fool's ballet. Being an mm. infantry person was a fool's ballet. So there was a lot of reluctance. So the Sikhs themselves were initially part of the infantry. He actually employed other denominations or groups to become part of the infantry. Then later on, the Sikhs were actually part of that as well. So it, there was a gradual increase in those branches of you know of the military if, if you can say that so it's, it's it's interesting when you see the numbers and i've got all the numbers within the book as well how they rise after certain periods after of recruitment as well okay viewers that are with us by all means if you've got any questions do join in you know it's a free fall so anything related you know i'd love to hear your um you know input on that i mean yeah we, we, we talk about you know obviously Maharaja raj ranjit singh and you know um, you know, the key pivotal kind of characteristics he brought to the military and, you know, his expertise and so forth. And then you mentioned, like, he brought others in. So just purely, again, out of curiosity, was were people brought in based on religion or their skills? It was definitely skills. Religion did not play a part in anything Maharaja Rajit Singh did. He was, you know, he was pro-religion. And pro-religion means every religion i mean before we touched upon the military side if you talk about the religious side he used to give grants to uh, mandas to uh, masids um to every denomination of religion you could have he would always give them grants basically this was in the punjab and further afield as well it was just to actually just to show his sovereignty but also to show that he had respected people of all faiths and this then came down in the fact that the punjab was very cosmopolitan as well and then this leads to the employment of foreigners or what we call Ferengis at that particular time, they were called Ferengis. Um, the Europeans were employed um, in the court to actually develop the military system. Now, individuals like General Allard, Ventura, Abu Dhabi, Court, these four major individuals I refer to in the book and I do an account of all four of them. Just to kind of show the innovations that they brought to the Sikh Empire, um, but then also they were actually um, faithful as well to Maharaja Ranjit Singh as well. So it just shows the loyalty of even the Europeans to Maharaja Ranjit Singh. I think anyone Ranjit Singh actually kind of had a good kind of relationship with, they were rewarded pretty well. <laughs> and you know, uh, these Europeans were rewarded well, and you can just see every, the legacy that they left afterwards as well. Let me ask you a question. So in the 18th century, there were, of course, the battles on the conquest against the Mughals and the Afghans. Was there any kind of switch from the Mughals and Afghans to ever come and join, you know, the Sikhs in war? Yeah, there was. Um, this really? is the thing, you see, because people think that, it was all, that. this was always people. Always, look, this is how, you know, people always like narratives which are so black and white. The Sikhs didn't like the Mughals, the Mughals didn't like the Sikhs, okay? Very easy to kind of describe. Um, 
but you know um like the marathas for instance there was a couple of joint campaigns which took place between the sikhs uh the mughal uh, uh governor adina Beg, he employed the sikhs to actually fight the afghans for instance so we had that happening in the punjab it's not clear cut it never happened on a wide scale but there is examples of you know the sikhs being part of the mughals to fight say the afghans um this this happened more than once for instance and during the the delhi area as well shah alam was happy to pay the sikhs to actually kind of help him as part of the war his, i'm gonna ask that question would it vice versa as well uh, the sikhs never employed uh any mughals no the sikhs would have no. did, did, did never employed any mughals never employed any afghans unless they defected if that makes sense. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. So they never actively recruited through their campaign no. unless they came over themselves. Absolutely, absolutely. And that's a really, really important point because even Ahmed Shah Abdali wanted to make a truce with the Sikhs eventually. And the Sikhs said, no way, we're not going to be actually kind of having any truce with us, especially after they'd also wiped out the majority population of the Sikhs. There was no way of coming back from that. But, you know, there has been instances of joint ventures taking place, not just with the Mughals, the Marathas, the Jats. So the Jats were a community, you know, um, which was located beneath the... Um, um, below Delhi uh, geographically and the Rajputs as well. So these alliances are more important than people know about, if I can say that. Now, just to throw this in the mix as well, it probably would have been your, one of your last questions, but I am also working on a Sikh missile book as well, separately, which okay. will cover this association with all these different groups. Yeah, well, we'll certainly touch upon that towards the end. Um, but, you know, it's really, really interesting to know because, like you said, the narrative has always been that they were with their teams, they were there with their teams, their armies, and that's it. But to actually know that they could defect and, you know, you know, kind of exchange in that way, you know, not exchange, but trade in that way, like, well, I'm going to go over there because things ain't working out. Do you think that was the now of um, worry that they know they were going to get beat on that side percentage? You think, right, I'm going to deflect now because we ain't looking good. <laughs> No, I think the religion really played a strong part um, in terms of um, how each group uh, kind of maintained themselves. But what we do find is, again, just moving a little bit away from the Punjab, but more towards the Delhi side, for instance. Um, so, look, the Marathas uh, employed, you know, Europeans as well, well before Maharaja Ranjit Singh did. So they used to have Europeans within their armies. And, you know, some of the so Europeans used to defect as well. So we talked about George Thomas earlier on. He defected from the Marathas to create his own empire and things like that as well. So there's always people jostling for positions depending on how powerful they became. And with the Sikh missiles as well, this is a really important thing as well. People think that once you're in, in a particular missile, you could stay in that missile. That wasn't true either. You could also defect from one missile to another missile as another. well. <laughs> yeah. Right, okay. So there's an so, internal disputes as well on that level, I guess, that could yeah, occur. Absolutely. And, you know, you know, I don't want to make anything perfect, but, you know, you, no, have, no. To, you have to point out these things as well. So, um, and they've got a lot of evidence of that taking place as well. Yeah. So. Well, it's far from perfect, as we know, you know, given the sources, if it's actually shared with due diligence and, you know, you know, with, a, with no restrictions. Um, you, you mentioned a few times about recruitment of, you know, um, you know, armies and you know, you know, into battle, etc. I'm just curious, how was that recruitment, you know, how were these recruitment campaigns done? How was that communicated? You know, you mentioned, you know, Maharaj Ranjit Singh and, you know, just Alawalia. How did they effectively go out and get the fighters that they needed to partake in battle? You know, it, it just boggles the mind at that time how that was communicated. We're so used to how things are done now through social media campaigns, newspapers, adverts. But at that time, if you're in a land of warfare and you know, massive open fields and whatever it might be, how do you do that? How do you recruit you know, specific individuals? I think the period of the 18th century differs with the Sikh Empire period. So I'll just break them down separately. So the Sikh um, missile period, remember the Sikhs were fighting for their survival. Correct. So let's just say you're a farmer and the Afghans have come and they've desecrated your area. You've got nothing left. You know, you'll join them. You'll join the Sikh missiles. So there was partly due to kind of um, economic reasons because you've got nothing left, partly due to the kind of um, the re religious sentiments already fed through the Sikhs forefathers. If you, if you were Sikh through, you know, Guru Gobind Singh and further afield. And so therefore, during this early phase, it was just literally 
bands of Sikh warriors under one leader. That's what it was, groups of 10, groups of 20. And okay. then they would go out and then recruit more followers, if that makes sense, because they were always... That on, made sense. Because they're Chakravati, yeah? So the word Chakravati means always on the move. And the Hang Sings call themselves Chakravati. So what that means is they're always on the move. So because they were always on the move, they would always be in contact with people. And because they were in contact with people, they would then, you know, show what they were able to do. And then other people wanted to follow them. And that's what okay. was the initial early kind of recruitment phase, at least during uh, the missile period. The Sikh we, Empire... We've, so we've only got 20 seconds remaining on this. Okay. So we do cut off. Yeah. Just give me two minutes and I'll have to yeah. jump in again. Okay. The Sikh yeah. uh, Empire period is slightly different because of the fact that uh, Maharaja Ranjit Singh now has um, conditioned uh, Sikh soldiery and he has general...